And now we turn to the Easter story from an eyewitness account as it is shared with us by John and his gospel beginning with the first verse of the 20th chapter. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary? She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, all the signs are out there. The grass is turning green. The trees and the flowers are beginning to bloom. If you open up the windows of your house, you'll hear the beautiful melodies of lawnmowers and weed eaters. <laughs> you gather with a group of people and you'll notice the cacophony of coughing and sneezing and sniffling. It's, spring is here, isn't it? <laughs> and of course, with all of God's creation coming to life once again, we as a people of faith know that it means Easter is here. We've made it through our time of preparation, the season of Lent, and we are prepared and ready to celebrate the good news of the empty tomb. And so we as a family of faith, as a community, we gather together this day to remember and to hear this story once again. So whether this is your first time here, or your first time to get with the community to celebrate this story, or whether you have done so dozens of times, we all come together with the same desire to open up our hearts to hear the story again and to ask God, speak to us this day. What good news of resurrection do you have for us here today in 2019? And so it's with that desire that we turn to this story once, and more, once again, as we do, Please join with me in a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we do come to you this morning thankful for the good news of the empty tomb, thankful for the good news, the resurrection of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so God, as surely as he lives, be present with us here today. Pour out your presence and your Holy Spirit upon us. Fill me with your Spirit. Use me as a vessel. Speak through me to share with each of us your message of truth and grace this day. Amen. Well, as we read that story, as you heard Mike read the story from the Gospel of John, it'd be hard to argue with uh, the fact that Jesus is the main character of today's story. 
But if we're talking about screen time, if we're talking about the person who's present the most in today's story, it's Mary Magdalene. We actually don't know a whole lot about Mary. Uh, there's a lot of Marys in the Bible, in the New Testament. There's Mary's mother. There's Mary's Magdalene. Uh, there's even one who's referred to as the other Mary. Like they just don't even know how else to describe her other than just the other Mary. So there's, there's a lot of Marys. But we know just a few things about Mary Magdalene. First of all, if you wanted to befriend her on Facebook, you wouldn't want to put Magdalene down as the last name. In fact, you'd want to put Magdalene down probably in hometown or lives in because that's the belief of most scholars that her name actually means Mary from or Mary of Magdala. See, Magdala was a small fishing village on the outskirts or on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. As you're likely aware, the Sea of Galilee features prominently in the stories of Jesus. He travels along uh, the shoreline to those communities preaching and teaching and healing. We read of how he gets in the boat and he crosses over to the other side of the sea. We read of how he walks upon the Sea of Galilee. And beyond that, the really only other piece of information we have of Mary comes not from the Gospel of John, but from the Gospel of Luke. Where Luke begins to list a number of people who are followers of Jesus. Beyond just the 12 disciples, Luke says there's also a number of women who follow and support Jesus upon his ministry. And then he names specifically Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons came out of. And so with just these little pieces of information, we, we kind of can put together Mary's story, can't we? Mary, a woman who was living in this small village called Magdala, there on the shore and was possessed by seven demons. I mean, whether you've experienced spiritual demons in your life or not, we've all experienced those things that hold us back, right? Those demons that seem to consume and control our lives. So we can maybe imagine what her life was like, right? Right? Unable to follow her hopes and dreams for herself, possibly ostracized by her community, seen as an outsider, unable to live the life that God has called her to live until the day that this traveling preacher, teacher, miracle worker comes to her town. And through this miraculous experience and encounter she has with him, those demons are drawn out of her and all of a sudden she experiences this freedom. Freedom from those things that bound her and held her back. Freedom to be who God has called her to be. Freedom to have new hopes and dreams for her life. And what does she do with this newfound freedom? She says, I'm going to follow this man. This man who has given me my life back. I am going to follow him. And so she does. She, the disciples, and many others, they follow him wherever he goes as he teaches and preaches. And they have this new dream for themselves. This dream of a new kingdom. A kingdom defined not by the world, but a kingdom defined by God where others encounter the Lord, where others get to experience his grace and his hope and his love firsthand. This is their dream until it all comes crashing down. In the Gospel of John and the others, we read that a number of Jesus' disciples and followers, when he's taken, when he's carried away, when he's hung upon that cross, the vast majority of them flee. They run out of attempt to save themselves, but we read that Mary Magdalene, is one of the few who stays to the bitter end. She's there at the foot of that cross watching as her teacher, her master, the one she had placed all her hopes and dreams upon, she's there watching as he breathes his last. You've been there before, haven't you? Maybe not at the foot of the cross watching your Lord die right there, but you've experienced the death of hopes the death of your dreams, right? Uh, maybe as a child, you know, we, we put so much meaning upon our friends and, and, and our community that when that best friend moves away, you feel like the world's come to an end, right? Or, or maybe it's your parents who come to you and say, we're, you know, mom or dad has gotten a new job and we're moving hours away. And you think that it has all come to an end. Or maybe as you got older, you had that dream school and you applied to it only to receive a rejection letter. Or maybe you had this dream job that you've always desired to do and you've always desired to, to have in your life and yet you find it unobtainable. You know, we have these hurdles in our lives that we have to overcome, right? But sometimes it's even more serious than those. Sometimes we have those dreams that when they die, it feels like a part of us has died as well. You, you and your spouse have always dreamed of having a family and yet you're told, you're infertile. 
you, you've been working for this company for, for 30 years. You've given them your life for 30 years, and now they've offered you early retirement. <laughs> your spouse, who you've dreamed of sharing forever with, tells you it's over. Uh, the doctor comes in and, and, and lets you know that they've exhausted all the options. There's nothing else they can do for your loved one. We've had these experiences, right? And you can come up with examples of your own. Things that you've experienced in your past, maybe things that you're experiencing today where your hopes, your desires, the dream that you have for your life seems to be coming to an end and you don't know what to do. I think that's where we find Mary in those pre-dawn hours on that Sunday morning so long ago as she goes to the tomb to pay, pay her respects to the dream that has died. She arrives at the tomb and she finds that this, the stone has been rolled away. And, and so she runs to a couple of disciples and tells them, someone's taken the body. I, I don't know what has happened. You need to come and see this. And, and the disciples, they come and they see and they confirm, yep, the body's gone. And then they go back. <laughs> and they leave Mary there standing outside the tomb and she's weeping. She finally gets up the nerve to look into the tomb. And when she looks in, she sees there where Jesus' body had been laid, she sees uh, two angels, one sitting at the head and one at the feet. And they ask her, woman, why are you weeping? And she tells them, they've taken my Lord and, and I don't know where they've laid him. And then she turns around and she sees a man who the scripture says uh, she believes to be the gardener. Now that might sound kind of weird to us at first, but, but understand that earlier in the gospel we read that where Jesus was crucified nearby there was a garden. And in that garden was a tomb that had yet to be used and it was there where Jesus had been laid. So it might make sense in her grief that she might think, oh, this is a gardener who's come to tend to the garden. And this man asks her well, as well, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? And, she's, and she just cuts right to the chase. She thinks that maybe he's been involved in this. He says, sir, if you have taken him somewhere, please just tell me so I can go take his body and bring it back. And this man speaks to her, he speaks her name, Mary. And upon hearing her name on this man's lips, it's, it's as if that fog of, and the cloud of grief and anger and despair just dissipates as she realizes this man in front of her is Jesus. That the impossible has happened. It's not some ghost or some figment of her imagination. Jesus is there, resurrected and alive. I, I wonder what kind of things are going through her head right now? I mean, imagine the roller coaster of emotions that she's experienced, that Mary and these other followers of Jesus, they've been following this mission and this desire, and these dreams that they have for bringing God's kingdom here to earth, and then they see it all dashed as Jesus dies on the cross, and yet now, three days later, here he is alive. Imagine what's going through her head. I wonder if she finds herself thinking about, this is amazing. We can go back to like things were. I mean, that might be tempting, right? Jesus, you're alive. We can go back to following you and you can be our teacher and preacher and miracle worker and we can follow you around Israel and we can make a real impact here in the world and we can just pretend that the last three days never even happened. This fixes everything, right? Last year, Easter fell on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day. <laughs> And I remember seeing on Facebook and hearing preachers and a whole bunch of other people saying things like, Jesus is dead, April Fool's. And, you know, because April Fool's joke, you get to pretend that, oh, it's not real, nothing, nothing happened, it's, everything's okay, it's all just a joke. But I remember kind of laughing and chuckling all about those, but then I started to think to myself, but yeah, but Jesus really died. It, it wasn't a joke. He really experienced that suffering and that pain there on the cross. He's got the scars on his hands, on his feet, on his side. The, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. This really happened. Is there any way we can pretend that it didn't? Just go back to how things were? Is it that way in your life? When you experience hardship, pain and sorrow, are you able to just go back and pretend it never happened? Do you think Mary could? I don't think so. 
I imagine that upon seeing Jesus there in front of her, Mary, she probably wraps him in a big old bear hug, uh, you know, because that's what I would do if someone I cared so deeply about that I thought was gone, I thought was dead, was now alive and, and right in front of me. And I also think this is the case because of the next thing Jesus says to her. <laughs> he says, don't hold on to me, <laughs> which I think is kind of Jesus saying, you know, Mary, you're squeezing a little too tight. I need you to let go. <laughs> We're going to have to have another resurrection here, you know, if you, I can't breathe. But I also think he's trying to tell her something else. Mary, don't hold on to me. Because things can't go back to like they were. Mary, don't hold on to the past. I can't go back to being just your teacher and your preacher and traveling miracle worker. Things have changed now. Things are different. Not just for Jesus, but Mary, things have changed for you as well. Because what we see in the story of Easter and the stories that follow is that, yes, Jesus comes out of the tomb, but, but no, he doesn't go back to being a traveling preacher and teacher and miracle worker. He, he, he goes on to ascend to be with our God in heaven. Things have changed for Jesus. But things have also changed in the life of Mary and his disciples and his followers as well. Because here we hear in this scripture, Jesus gives her a new dream. He didn't say, look, Mary, we just go back to like things were, pretend that this never happened. No, instead he says, yes, the scars are here. Uh, are here. Yes, I died, but I have been resurrected and God is going to do something new in your life. You've experienced hardship and pain and sorrow and that's still going to impact your life, but God also wants to do something new for you now. Because you're going to go back and no, you're not just going to be following me. No, you're not just going to be helping me as I teach and preach. It's now going to be your opportunity for you to tell the story. I'm going to give you a new dream, Mary. Not one where you just follow me, but one where you're a messenger. Where you tell the story. Where you share the good news. Where you spread the grace and the love of God. Starting with my disciples. Go tell them what you've experienced. Go tell them what you have seen. What we see here through the story of Mary is that God is going to do something new in her life, in the life of the disciples and Jesus' followers. And I think that, for me, is the good news of the Easter. That is the story of the resurrection. The story isn't that God enters into our lives and says, look, I'm going to just fix it all and put it all back like it was. We're going to pretend that hardship and pain and the difficulties and the sorrows that you feel, we're going to pretend that they never happened. I'm just going to put everything back like it was. No, that's not the story of Easter. Because yes, we will experience happiness and joy, but we will also experience pain and heartache in the world. And just like Jesus, when we look at our lives, you're going to see that the scars are still on your hands and on your side and in your life. But the good news of Easter is that the worst thing that happens to you in your life is not the last thing. The good news of Easter is that death and darkness do not have the final word. The sun will rise, tomorrow is coming, and nothing will stop the grace and the love and the light of God shining into our lives, shining into your world, and transforming it and resurrecting something new this day. So yes, maybe you move, but you find that you have the opportunity to be touched by and to touch the lives of so many others, so many more people than you would if you had stayed just in one single place all your life. Yes, you, you've experienced the broken promises in your life, but you find comfort and security in those promises that remain from those friends and those family who you remain devoted to one another. You find comfort and strength in the promises of a God who is eternal and will never abandon your side. Yes, you experience the heartache of infertility, but through the blessing of adoption and foster care, you realize that family is about so much more than biology. And yes, you know that you have a limited amount of time with your loved one, but you give thanks to God and you rejoice in the joy, the love, and the memories that have been shared, and you cherish every moment that you have together. The good news of Easter doesn't tell us that we won't experience pain and heartache. But the good news of Easter tells us that God plans for something even greater, even after we experience hardships in our lives. The good news of Easter says that God is coming into our world and nothing, not death, not a tomb, nothing will stop his light and his love from shining upon you and creating and resurrecting something new today. The good news of Easter is that no matter what, is, what has happened, no matter what is going on in your life right now, God wants to enter in 
was to resurrect a new mission, a new dream, and hope for you in your life this Easter and every day. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to hear this message of God's grace, hope, and love. My name is Pastor Kyle, and I want to invite you to connect with Stillwater First UMC further by checking out more of our sermons on SoundCloud or iTunes, or by visiting our church website at fumcstw.org. While on our website, you can read about the many ways God is working through First Church and how you can be part of its ministries. Make a financial contribution so that we can continue to serve. Or click on the contact tab to let us know where you're listening from, ask questions, and share the joys and concerns of your heart so that we can be in prayer with you. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you once again, and God bless.